This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello and welcome to the latest Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. I'm Matt Addison with Ian Doyle and Theo Squires alongside me. We'll be talking the FA Cup transfers, Thiago Alcantara, Zerdan Shaqiri and Sepp Vandenberg shortly. But we'll begin, Ian, with Aston Villa, who were defeated, or certainly a version of Aston Villa, were defeated by four goals to one on Friday night. We probably didn't learn too much about Liverpool, but I suppose the win, if you want to call it that, was without injuries. And it was probably as close to a win as possible for Liverpool, given the opposition they were playing. No, they won, and that's all that mattered. And nobody got injured, as you said. So, other than that... There was that mild, what was it, about 15 minutes where people were slightly concerned. But really, even Aston Villa was saying, we we know quite well we've got no chance of winning this game. I think it was Louis Barry got interviewed afterwards. I think he said for about five or ten minutes, they were like, oh, hang on, we could get something out of this. Then, obviously, Liverpool's great fitness and experience toll. But it was just a game that I think everybody just had to get through. I mean, Villa obviously benefited in the sense that their youngsters... um, the youngsters will have gained from the experience. I mean, one of the players was 16 and one of them was, was had not long just turned 17. So it was a, a good good game for them. In terms of for Liverpool, as you say, we didn't learn a lot. We learned Thiago's quite good at football, but we already knew that. We also learned that you know, Jürgen Shaqiri, he, he's good at the old assists. But otherwise, it was just one to just get through. Liverpool got the job done. I don't think anybody's particularly criticising them. There wasn't anything they could do about it. The only interesting thing for me, really, is that Liverpool... Obviously, this season, I think they decided to take the FA Cup a little bit more seriously than perhaps they have in the, in recent years. Whether that's partly because of the fact that they can't have a certain amount of under twenty threes in the bubble, shall we say? Because obviously, they most of them are, are training separately. So perhaps they've just made, took the decision: we've got to stick with this first team squad and, and see how we go in the competition. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about rhythm and, and Manchester United a little bit later. I think it, it probably ties in a little bit that as with with that as well. But first of all, Theo, I mean, I think you've got to give huge credit to, to Aston Villa's kids because not just Louis Barry, but one or two others seem to, to do quite well against Liverpool. And we didn't exactly learn too much from a Liverpool perspective, but I suppose for, for them, they just have to look at it and take the positives that they can. Yeah, well, if you think back to the um, League Cup game last year, for the Villa lads, it will just be a case of do better than losing 5-0 because you want to do it on that for that morale boost. They've done better than Liverpool youngsters did against Villa's first team last year. And it's such an amazing experience for them. Like, it would have been one thing if you're playing Liverpool's second string. Like, granted, it was Kevin Keller in goal, but you're still playing Mohamed Salah. You're still playing Sadio Mane. And we saw at the end, was it Louis Barry chasing after Fabinho to get his shirt back? It's like a great story for them, a great experience for them. They've held their own. And it's one where... Well, we said last season how great it was for Liverpool's youngsters to get the opportunities in the FA Cup, in the League Cup, against these first team sides. And while it wasn't always the best result for them, they certainly learned from it. Like you compare how Liverpool did against Villa in the League Cup to how they were doing when a few of them had the chance against Everton, how they did against Shrewsbury. And you could see from that alone how they learned from it. And you'd imagine it's going to be the same for Aston Villa now. Like they've got some talented players. We, we looked at a few of them before the game, looking at who's to um, would be the star name. And I think Louis Barry was the one that most people are aware of. He's been linked with, um, I believe, Liverpool and Everton in the past. I couldn't tell you which. I just know from doing the live blogs from when he was coming over from Barcelona. And obviously, he's got his goal. That's a great story for him. You can see the emotion on his face and what it meant to them. That was the story, wasn't it? You knew Liverpool would win, but Villa gave them a bit of a fright at one point and they got their goal. And now it's just all of Paul's cup competition adventure can start properly in the fourth and fifth rounds. Yeah, we'll find out who Liverpool are to face in that fourth and potentially fifth round if they get through in. But you mentioned it before. I mean, Jurgen Klopp hasn't always been a big fan of the FA Cup. But do you think this season he should be taking it seriously? And and do you think that the lineup on Friday was an indication that he will? Or was it perhaps more just the <laughs> fact that there was enough of a gap for Liverpool to be able to go a little bit stronger? Yeah, I think there's probably a bit in what I said about the, the bubble. I think there's something in that. that you could, that's the reason why Villa couldn't play a lot of their leading under-23s players, because they've been training with the first team. That's what, It wasn't even all of Villa's best under-20 academy players. It was like, I mean, there's still some decent ones there, but you know a lot of the, the better ones were, were, had been training with the first team. So from that point of view, also I think if you look at it from you know Jurgen Klopp's point of view, that he loves... Well, what doesn't he like about the FA Cup? Replays. 
so they're not happening this season. So he doesn't really have any excuse in that regard. And I think this is a competition that Liverpool haven't done particularly well in under him. I think uh, I've worked it out that he's the first Liverpool manager to take charge of an FA Cup, permanent manager to take charge of an FA Cup uh, campaign or at least one that hasn't reached at least the semi-finals since about the 1950s. You look at it, you go through Shankly, Paisley, Brendan Rodgers got there, Benitez won it, Julier won it, Sunas won it, Dalglish won it, um, Joe Fain got to a semi-final. Um, have I missed anybody out there? Roy Hodgson didn't actually take charge of a campaign because obviously he got let go just before they played United in the third round. So Evans lost in the final. Evans lost in the final, yeah. yeah. So they've all done pretty well in the competition. Bjorn Klopp, for, for you know, a number of reasons, has not quite... Possibly taking it seriously as, you know, he didn't even turn up for one of the games last season, did he? Which, I mean, the, the funny thing is, is that the games where Liverpool have been criticised, I mean, probably mentioned it now, you know, Tony Cascarino came out on TalkSport and said he thought it was slightly disrespectful that Liverpool played a first-choice team. Well, hang on. You know, this this time last year, they were playing a, a number of kids against Everton and they also played an entire under-23 team against you know, Shrewsbury in a fourth-round replay. Before that, they played the youngest team ever in 2017 against Plymouth and the year before in Klopp's first game in the in the uh, in the FA Cup at Exeter. I mean, I was on the bench, so you know that tells you how strong the team was. And what what of all those games were in common? Liverpool won all of them. They got through every single time. So it's like when when they've put a stronger team out is when they've tended to suffer a little bit. I mean, they had a full choice team against West Brom a couple of years ago and got beat three two on the uh, the John Moss VAR game, which is the first experience that Anfield had of VAR. So yeah, I mean. I think this is a competition Liverpool could possibly do well in. The fact that there's no replays will help. The fact that the games, I think, after the next round are mostly played in midweek will also help because it means there's no other games being moved around. So, yeah, I think I think they've got a chance because it's obvious that for a number of reasons they're going to have to go pretty strong. And Theo, we're, we're going to move on a, a little bit shortly, but I know you wanted to have a, a quick word on Nico Williams. He was one who... He's obviously a young player himself, but he seemed to, to do quite well on Friday night. Yeah, he did. Like He's had some stick, hasn't he, so far this season. He's had his dodgy moments. But you could tell he looked confident in this game. Like He was getting on the ball a lot, getting crosses in a lot, getting down the right-hand side. And you wanted to see that sort of performance from him when we've had a, been talking about Trent Alexander-Arnold not being in the best form. And it's like, well, he's just going to have to keep his place because you don't have the faith in the understudies because there's such a drop-off. But for Nico Williams to go in and not make a mistake, because granted, like most of the players on that start at 11, they're not much they can learn from it. Like it's like you just do your job and you're going to get the win. And it, but you don't want any of those negative headlines. But Nico Williams caught the eye the same way that might maybe he wasn't uh, a star name, the fact that Thiago, Jordan, and Shakiri when they came on. But from the start at 11, who at the moment, he was the one who was getting involved, doing what he had to do. And it would be certainly pleasing for Jurgen Klopp going forward so that he grabbed his opportunity. And he can be an option when we're going to have to see Liverpool continue to rotate with fixture congestion going forwards. Yeah, Ian, I've written something in the, the last couple of days about rhythm being a key word for Jurgen Klopp. There's a, a video explaining all of the stats behind that in terms of the gap between matches on our YouTube channel as well. I mean, it's not something that Liverpool have coped with too well in the past, but it's something they're going to have to come to terms with this week. It's going to be 13 days between Premier League matches in between that. They've only had that game on Friday night, but they have come up with a special plan this week. They're going to do a sort of pre-season type thing this week in order to get themselves fit for that game on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned something before. The FA Cup game are the same thing, basically saying I thought Liverpool might go strong simply because they needed to, to get that rhythm, especially after the results that they'd had. You know, before I did the goal of, you know, the goal of straw at Newcastle, the defeat Southampton, and then spending most of the game against West Brom just... Hitting Sam Allardyce in the face or whatever it was that was happening there, um, but you know, driving into his back butts and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, this week, I mean, Jurgen Klopp came out after the game. He said something about you know, as you say, a little. He's going to have a little pre-season. Uh, uh, he's mentioned about eleven v eleven games, and I had a I had a quick look at myself and the fact that the last time he's had a full week with his players, well, he had one over Christmas, but that was Christmas week, so the players wouldn't have been there Christmas Day, or you'd imagine they've had an extra day off or two for obvious reasons, but the previous time before that was the before the Chelsea game, which was the, right at the start of the season. I think it was the second game of the season, wasn't it, I think? Uh, yeah, because they beat Leeds, yes. Yeah, so that was the... They had eight days to work on that, so it is... This will be like, you can almost draw a line through the season. Well, it's not quite in terms of Premier League games. Liverpool have played most of their Champions League games already. They're obviously 
out of the League Cup. We can draw a line through this week and say this is the first half of the season's gone, second half of the season's incoming now. And I think Klopp will do that. I mean, the only disappointment for him is that two of his three summer signings who were the ones he you know, possibly needed to to get a bit more, you know, acclimatised with his team are injured. I know Jota's done well, but, but you know, Simakas has barely kicked a ball, hasn't he, since he, uh, since he arrived. So they'll be... He'll be looking at one or two things. I'd imagine they'll be looking at getting a bit more out of the midfield because I can imagine that, you know, later this week we'll be discussing who on earth's going to play centre back, given the, you know, Fabinho will be one of them and if Real Matip's fit, he'll go straight back in. But if he can't play, then Liverpool have a big decision to make there. And I think they're going to have to also work on the assumption that Matip's not going to play every game. So they're going to have to come up with different ways of getting the midfield working because I think defensively, Liverpool have done all right. Since you know, since Virgil Van Dijk hasn't started a match, which was obviously after the Everton game, I think is it eight or nine goals in fourteen games, or or something like that. It's it's a lot fewer goals than you think. But the only problem on top of that is that because you've got a key midfielder playing in mid, playing in centre back, that it's disrupted the rest of the balance of the team. And while Liverpool are still the Premier League's top scorers, they've had more games where they've struggled to get the goals that's converted into wins, which is why they've drawn so many games, which is why they could go into the United game on. Uh, on Sunday, behind behind United in the table. Yeah, since Virgil van Dijk got injured, they've not conceded more than once in a Premier League game. But as Ian says there, Theo, I mean, it, it does take away something from the midfield and, and going further forward. But I suppose Thiago Alcantara and Zerdan Shaqiri, we might as well talk about those two players now. I mean, both of those, probably in particular Thiago in terms of the midfield and, and Shaqiri, of course, going forward as well they could make a big difference in terms of that creativity. Yeah, they could. They're exciting players and what they did against Aston Villa is what you expect when they play. It doesn't matter who they're playing against, whatever level. If you give them time on the ball, you give them space, they will pick holes in defences and they will set up goals. That's just the talent that has always been on show from them and they've done it throughout their careers. And it was almost too easy for them against what was then a tired, young Aston Villa side. The space was always going to open up for them. They were always going to be dangerous players. But it is that positive for Jurgen Klopp going forward. He's going to hope that they can both stay fit and make that difference and offer that creativity. Because if you happen to play a Fabinho at centre-back, what we're going to assume for the rest of the season, and there might be games where Jordan Henderson is dropping back there as well, the midfield has lost something which has had that impact on the front three. And whether it's keeping them fresh or if there's a change of a system, you need that creativity, that um, playmaker in there somewhere for what is going to make the difference. And Jordan Shakiri and Thiago can make that either from the deeper role or Shakiri just behind the front three. I think we saw him in one of the league games was at Sheffield United earlier in the season where he's combined with Yotta. I think it was that one. It might have been West Ham, one of those ones, when he's gone and helped set up the winning goal. He is a match winner. It's why out of all the players who have been in and out of the football team, in and out the bench, Shakiri is probably the one the happiest to keep hold of compared to, say, Origi. It's why Jurgen Klopp does turn to him now when he's got those opportunities where he's on the bench. And you want to see more from him because, as he showed in his first season at the club, when he gets a run of games, he's a dangerous player. He might not be someone who's got a long-term future at Liverpool for, say, three, four years, but he's still going to make a difference. And when they're competing for trophies, Premier League, Champions League, and as it stands, FA Cup, he will get those game times. He will get that opportunity. And his player, Jurgen Klopp, can be glad he's still got around because, as he showed against Villa, he bring him on, he will create goals. Two assists in five minutes for Zerdan Shaqiri, Ian. But looking ahead to the Manchester United game, is there any way that Shaqiri could be in that Liverpool eleven? Because I suppose you, you want the front three there and you probably want the three in midfield to be Wijnaldum, Thiago and Henderson, don't you? Well, in answer to the question, no, he's not going to start. However, he did come off the bench and score twice a couple of years ago against United. So that's something that perhaps will play in the mind of Jurgen Klopp. Probably play in the mind of United as well, actually, because the players remember stuff like that. Um, but yeah, Shakiri, I think he's he's only played eight games this season. I think it's something like 305 minutes. And he's had, I think it's three assists. And he scored the one goal against um, Lincoln, the free kick. And also he's, he's played a part in, you know, an earlier part in some of the goals. Do you think of the pass he put in for... Trent Alexander-Arnold against, I think that was Mid Michelin, wasn't it, in the Champions League? He put in, he, and Trent crossed it and Jota put it in and it was West Ham the other game where Shakiri put in Jota to score the winner. So, yeah, he's, he's he's managed to make a difference when he's been on the pitch. The only problem is, I think there's him and Thiago 
are the two players who played the least amount of minutes out of the ones that you might expect this season. Obviously, Thiago was out for a long time with his knee injury, but Shaqiri kind of disappeared, didn't he, as well? Because he had the that problem that he, he got after the international break when nobody actually quite knew what it was, and then he disappeared for seven weeks, which Liverpool could have done with him in that time. So I think there are going to be, I think Liverpool have got six or seven games in 21 days, something like that, or 22 days. It's something I'm ending with, I think it's the Manchester City home game, which is in about a month. So there's quite a, quite a lot of big games coming up. So if he's going to start making a difference now, might be a good time because that extra quality is going to, going to be needed. And, you know, the other thing about the FA Cup is Liverpool stay in that. It's five subs. That's the thing is that would he have got on had it been a league game? I don't know. I mean, he probably might have done actually, given the way the game was going. But, you know, he's got more scope of getting more minutes in the in the FA Cup and the Champions League as well. So for those are the kind of competitions that him and we haven't even mentioned Naby Keita, who's obviously got injured over the festive period. We didn't see him after the Palace game, I think it was. And, you know, he had a good game there and Liverpool scored seven. I don't think that was a coincidence that they scored that many with him on the pitch. So Liverpool have got the options just to make sure that they're fit and they're available and Jurgen Klopp's given the option to to use them in the way that he sees fit because possibly if you've got Juan Aldum, Jones, Shakiri, Thiago, Cater, Oxe Chamberlain as well, then you can say right Henderson and Fabinho can play centre back. Yeah, looking forward to it. I mean, it, it's probably unlikely, as Ian says, that we see Shakiri from the start next weekend. But there are matches coming up that you would think would suit him. Burnley, for example, is a classic one where you might just need that extra bit of quality. And he showed, even though it was against a very young Aston Villa team, that well, he's done it before this season as well. Of course, he can provide that for Liverpool. Yeah, definitely. And I think, as we saw against West Brom, you are going to have teams that will just defend deep, absorb pressure. And Liverpool at times have struggled to break them down. And those are the games where you need your Shigiris to make the difference, where he can be that extra body causing mischief in that final third, where he can pick that space, pick the hole and put thread a pass out of nowhere. And he is a dangerous player. We saw it in his first season, as I said before, that he can make the difference either starting or coming off the bench. It's, while Liverpool, he's always had his injury issues and he's missed games. When he does play, he does return the goals and he does return the assists. And it's that trust, isn't it, about whether he can be in this midfield, uh, have that defensive work rate. And Jurgen Klopp's doubted that at times because he's not going to be, as uh, I suppose, on the right ahead of Mohamed Salah. But he has stepped up for big moments. And there are those games, I think, against your Burnleys or whatnot, where Jurgen Klopp will look to rotate and save legs. Like we saw it against um, Crystal Palace, didn't we? When Salah was on the bench, Minamino got the start. It's like, well, Shakiri's another option there. And as we had Jurgen Klopp talking before the FA Cup game, that Minimino had been unlucky not to get his opportunities. Shakiri's another one like that. And it's like, well, if you've got that fire in your belly to prove a point, to make your mark, then you will get the chances to deliver for Liverpool this season, especially when you've got the five substitutes. It'll be a case of having your best 11 available for the Premier League. And as we've seen in the Champions League and the FA Cup, Jurgen Klopp's almost going to be doing a 60-minute team and a 30-minute team because he knows he can just change half the side and see what's going to get the job done, whether it's a case of putting your weaker team out and then only using your star names if you need them for that final 30 minutes, or it's a case of getting it done early and then bringing them off on the hour mark. I've seen a little bit of criticism, Ian, for Jordan Henderson's performance. He came off at half-time, presumably. That was going to happen no matter what the scoreline or, or the performance of Liverpool was like. But have you any concerns at all about him? Because I thought he, he just looked a little bit tired in that match. Yeah, he's bloody awful. It's the worst I've seen him play forever for Liverpool. I thought he, every single, it's not as if he did have enough of the ball. He just kept on trying these ridiculous diagonals or passing it straight to Aston Villa. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. It's just one of those things. You've got to bear in mind that, what was it, about four or five days later, he, earlier, sorry, he played at centre-back against Southampton and had been probably Liverpool's best player. So, no, I've got no concerns there. I think he knew, I think it was, it was pre-arranged that he'd go off at half-time. So, you know, with Thiago coming on, I mean, the interesting thing about Thiago, I know we're getting some messages, people saying, oh, we love Thiago and stuff like that, is that, he's, well, this is going to be, his, if he plays, it'll be his first game at Anfield for Liverpool. I mean, it's, it's, he's been there since, what, September? And I know there's no supporters there, but it's still a, a big deal. It'll be a big deal for him because I'm pretty sure the only other time he's played there was the nil-nil for Bayern Munich against Liverpool in the Champions League. Uh, but was that nearly two years ago now? So, you know, and, and it's an interesting one because the games that he's played, when he come on against Aston Villa half-time, he's basically playing against a team that's got everybody in the box. 
when he played against Chelsea, come on at half time, he played against a team that basically put most people in the box. They were down to 10 men. Um, came on against Newcastle, they had, towards the end, they had everybody behind the ball. Um, what other games he played? Southampton, there was a, I was that's it. I've got to say, yes. Southampton, Southampton is the one where in the first half, it was the first time you really saw him like, oh, the, the pace of the game's possibly got to me. But don't forget, he'd been out for that long. But then the second half, once again, Samson had everybody behind the ball and he was like pulling the strings. And so going back to the Everton game, yeah, it's the one where Everton had a bit more of a go at it. But that's the one where perhaps he's had his best performance because he he got himself into the game and he started passing the ball. And obviously we saw he set up what should have been the winner for, obviously we had a party, what should have been the winner for Henderson in injury time with the pass for Mane. And that's the game that is probably going to be most like the game that he's going to face against United on Sunday. And he's shown that, you know, we've mentioned this before, it's ridiculous the amount of headers he wins in midfield. A little bit like Steve Gerrard in that respect, who was very un- underrated with the, with how he how good he was in the air. The difference being, I think Gerrard's about five foot eleven, six foot, and Thiago's about five foot four or something like that. He's, he's only tiddly. But uh, now he's, he's shown his class. The thing is, is that anybody who's not, not criticising him, but who's, who's wondering what he's like, they've always been able to say, look, Chelsea had 10 men, et cetera, et cetera, you're playing against Villa's kids. I think on Sunday we'll have a chance, because I think he'll start, I think on Sunday we'll have a chance to see what he's actually made of, especially when he's up against a, a United midfield that will probably have you know, Bruno Fernandes, the not world-class midfielder, and uh, and Paul Pogba, possibly. And let's play this, Scott McTominay, I reckon it could be. So, they, they, you know, United have got a million options in midfield, so it will be interesting to see how that one goes. But if Thiago is the player that we all think he is, then I think Sunday's the time for him to show it. Yeah, hugely exciting for Thiago and for Liverpool fans, Theo, to be able to see him finally at Anfield and in a big game as well. This is the kind of game that these big world-class players have to sort of stamp their mark on. And you'd imagine, given some of the names on the pitch, he is the one that Liverpool will look to 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 try and play through and, and try and win that match. Yeah, definitely. That's why Liverpool signed him. He's a world-class player. He's probably the most high-profile player they've signed in the Premier League era. And it's someone you want to make a difference in these games. It's someone they're going to obviously give the ball to and see what he can do, see if he can unlock that defence. Uh, he is going to be against some high-profile players, as Doyle's just mentioned, with Fernandes and possibly Pogba. But from what we've seen so far from throughout his career, rather than just his Liverpool career, he, it does look different, doesn't he? Like you can hear the pundits every time he gets in the ball. It's like I think it was Michael Owen saying he just makes him want to watch football twenty four hours a day. He's just a league above. It's like he's thinking so far ahead of everyone else, and you're just waiting for him to properly sink in with the front three because we all know how intelligent a footballer Roberto Firmino is, and we all know what Mane and Salah can do when they've got time and space to run at defenses. And they've had the missed Van Dijk's passing ability from the back this year. But Thiago is that deep line playmaker who can just pick anyone out wherever he wants. When you've got the fullbacks maybe not contributing as many assists as we've seen in the past, it's a different thing for opposing teams to keep an eye on. The fact that Thiago can just spray a pass 60 yards without even breaking a sweat and go toe to toe. Um, we've seen him run at defences too. He likes to go for a little dribble. He's tried to have a few shots, but I think he's had a few efforts blocked. It'd be quite nice if he could uh, get off the mark when against Manchester United, like finally properly arrive at Liverpool Football Club. It's the biggest game that you're going to have this season. It could be decisive in the title race. While it would be too early to be given anything away, Liverpool could potentially be third going into it with City's game in hand as well. And if they're dropping further back, if they drop points in it, it's like you definitely need him to stand up and be counted. Liverpool fans have been waiting a long time to see him. He's shown glimpses, but this is where you need to stand up, be counted, and show why Liverpool was so desperate to sign you, why Jurgen Klopp's been a big fan of yours for so long. £25 million might not seem like a lot of money in the current market, but it got them a world-class player. Now he needs to show why he's got that reputation. Yeah, certainly something to look forward to, and we'll have plenty of content throughout the week looking ahead to that Manchester United game. Just before we finish here, though, we will have a quick discussion about the transfer market, Ian. We've known all along it's been unlikely that Liverpool would get anything done this month in terms of incomings, but it's still something that is being talked about. We've discussed plenty of times, you know, the reasons for and against Liverpool making a transfer move, but it just seems to be the case that it'll be all eyes on the summer for any reinforcements rather than anything changing this month. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> and your thoughts on that? <laughs> I've ran out of new thoughts. Um, it's just just the same thing over and over again, isn't it? You just got to get fans say, you know, you've seen Jamie Carrigan. Quite a lot of other people have said they'll be wasting a great opportunity if they don't come out and sign somebody. But who can they sign? Is the thing. I mean, I saw somebody saying, you know, what about Tamori at Chelsea? They're going to put him out on loan. Why on earth would Chelsea want to want to give him to Liverpool? It doesn't make any sense. The, the, the title rivals, oh, I know, they're one weakness. What we can do is we can put, give them one of our players who we consider to be better than the other centre-back options they've got. That will be a really good thing for us to do. They're never going to do that. This is the, the other thing as well, is that Liverpool... The other thing for Liverpool is that they know that whoever comes in, at the end of the season, Van Dijk, Gomez, OK, we don't know what they're going to be like, but you'd imagine, you know, given the fact Van Dijk's looks as though he's, he's recovering quite well. Joe Gomez has shown in the past he can get over serious injuries, that the pair of them will be back and Matip's still there and suddenly you've got the options of, well, Fabinho could go there. You know, I'd imagine Reese Williams will still be there. So it's like, well, there's tons of centre-backs here. Why, why on earth would I want to go to Liverpool? I might not be playing all the time. I mean, obviously you go to Liverpool because you might want to win something, but it's how much part you want to play. And I think you know, it's a tough one for Liverpool in that respect. And, you know, Jurgen Klopp mentioned it last week money money situation we're seeing now clubs are posting their accounts they're all posting these massive losses because of the pandemic i mean you've got to bear in mind that for nearly all of these clubs they haven't played in front of a crowd for home crowd for 10 months liverpool had three get three games wasn't it with two thousand? that's it six thousand fans in 10 months that's you know you're going to lose quite a lot of money on, on that and all the other associated stuff that goes around the match day and i think you know, I think they had, to, they had to give a bit of money back as well, didn't they, for the TV deal last year? Wasn't there a little bit? You had to give a little bit of that back as well, and they wouldn't have budgeted for that. So all the clubs are going to take a hit, and Liverpool are no different. And, you know, you look around, and who's moved anywhere? What are we? You know, January 11th, who's moved? Who's gone anywhere? It's not well, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> the, the, most, the most West Brom transfer ever. Um, yeah, but that, that's the, well, there you go. The, the other thing is the transfer window only shut halfway through October. So it's not wasn't that long ago. I know it was about October the fifth or sixth for overseas signings, but it's not been that long since it was open. So what's changed in all that time for the clubs? I mean, we know situations have changed in terms of Liverpool's injuries, but in terms of players that they may be after or maybe trying to get in the summer, are those clubs going to let them go earlier? I don't think so. So while I understand all of the issues that Liverpool have got, and that well, the fans, the, the issue of the fans, I think you know, I think they're just going to have to just get on with it. Yeah, it's not quite as simple as it might seem. I'll stay with you, Ian, because there might be a centre-back departing Liverpool in Sepp Vandenberg. It looks like there's a, a few different clubs interested in taking him on loan. Yeah, there's clubs from, where is it, uh, Switzerland, Belgium, and there's some Bundes, second, second division German team. So he's somebody who he was on the bench, wasn't he, against Lincoln back in September. Since then, he's not really, he hasn't been involved in a, in a, in a match day squad. He had a few chances last season, but this season he's kind of, I wouldn't so much say so much fallen down the pecking order. I just think other players have come in and taken their chances, whereas perhaps he didn't really do that last season. Certainly at the at the at the top level, he did. Uh, he had a good game against Shrewsbury in the FA Cup, I thought actually. And, and don't forget that it was he played in the um, he played in the EFL Trophy. I think it was at, played it against. I think it was Tranmere and Wigan. He certainly played against Tranmere, and it was at that game there were a few scouts looking around because it was right near the transfer deadline and. He may have gone out on loan then. It didn't quite happen, but it looks as though it's going to happen this time. And given the fact that he's not close to the first team, shall we say, but it, it's better to go and get some senior football than be playing for the under-23s. And if he does leave on loan, Theo, I mean, what does that mean for him going forward? He's 19 now, Sepp Vandenberg. Does this show that he's still some way off the first team, given all the injuries that Liverpool have had? He's still... As Ian says, not even come into contention really since right in the early parts of the Carabao Cup. Yeah, it's just strange with him because he's like almost been forgotten. Like you forget he's an option there. Like when Liverpool have been um, losing these centre backs to injury, you've never heard someone go, "Oh, we've got Vandenberg there; he can step up." And it's strange when you think to where he's come from. Like he like, was playing games in Holland when he was what 16, 17, and it's not as though he's been playing these no marks. He was playing the Ajaxes, the Fire Nords, the PSVs. Like when within the like his second ever game, he was playing against Robin Van Persie. He's played against Tuntar. He's played against some decent level players there. And he must have shown something in Holland for the scouts to want to bring him to Liverpool. 
And it's just not happened for him for whatever reason. Doyle would be better placed to comment on his performances last year for like the second string than me. But he's never really caught the eye. And you've said, oh, Vandenberg's had a really good game there. He should be knocking on that first team door. And it's just strange when you think, well, the first day of pre-season, if you'd said you're going to lose Van Dijk and Gomez for the majority of the campaign, you think, oh, you've got Dejan Lovren. No, nope, he's going to get sold. You're not going to replace him. Joel Matip's going to do Joel Matip things and just be injured for half the campaign in and out. If you'd looked at the younger players, Vandenberg would have probably been top of the list along with Hover to get that opportunity. Now, obviously, Keanu Hover got sold and Vandenberg's not had that look in. But until Klopp started talking about Cometio, you wouldn't have thought he was in the mix. Reese Williams was someone you didn't think was anywhere near it because he'd been on loan to like Kidderminster Harriers. And that Phillips, for all intents and purposes, was gone. Like They didn't expect him to still be at the club. They thought he was going to get his loan exit, permanent exit to the championship. And it just didn't happen. It's like, well, why is Vandenberg not getting that opportunity then when out of all the players, he seems to be better placed? Like, he's one of the ones with the most experience there, along with Phillips, who's had that time in the second division in Germany. But they'd rather turn to a player who's played in the conference. And you think, well, Reese Williams, he's not had the easiest of times in Liverpool first team. He's made a few mistakes leading to goals. And obviously, younger players, they are going to make mistakes leading to goals. And it's not as though they've got a Virgil van Dijk to talk them through it, guide them through it, playing alongside a midfielder. Uh, they need stability. And it's something they've not had this year because it's always a change in centre-back partnership week in, week out. So it's going to make it harder. But I think it says it all. Uh, if you've had your opportunities and not taken them, you need to go out elsewhere. It's not like Harvey Elliott going out on loan where you know where well, you're never going to get in ahead of Salah, Minamino, Shakiri, Varney, Firmino, Yotta, Rigi, etc. etc. There was an opportunity there for a centre back. And the fact that Vandenberg has never even come into the conversation, it says I think quite a lot about where he is in the pecking order at the moment, what the staff think about him. He needs to go out on loan and to really stake a claim. Um, but then the divisions Doyley's just mentioned, it's like, well, is that going to be enough to get you back into the first team reckoning at Liverpool? Granted, Nat Phillips did all right in the second division in Germany, but it wasn't with an eye to get into the first team at Liverpool. It was with an eye to get a move elsewhere. And the only reason he's still at Liverpool is because it didn't happen. Um, but Vandenberg has got time on his age. Like we say, Phillips is, what, early 20s, 22, something like that. Vandenberg's still a teenager. He can still turn it around. And there must have been something in him for Liverpool scouts to sign him the first time, sign him in the first place. But we've just not seen it yet. I think the problem is with Vandenberg is that it's the type of defender that he is. I think the pro- for Liverpool, Joe Gomez and Virgil Van Dijk, the two of the two, their two fastest defenders. That's why they could play a high line. You know, they're not slouches. Even even Lovren wasn't particularly slow. Matip is a little bit different, but you know, Vandenberg's not the quickest. Uh, Nat Phillips is definitely not the quickest. I think Reese Williams, I think, is isn't slow, but I just think he's been caught out positionally a couple of times. It wasn't so much the, you know, he he could have actually fouled Barry, couldn't he? But he didn't want it. He just got out of the way of him to make sure he didn't get sent off. So I think with Vandenberg, I think it's his lack of pace or or, or what appears to be a lack of pace. As I say, I've I've seen him quite a lot. There's quite a few games within the twenty threes where he's just not looked that impressive, but. Lately, when I've seen him play, he's, he's looked a little bit better as if he's coming to terms with it, but he's not the type of defender that Liverpool need at the moment, And whereas Cometio is quite fast, and that's why you're perhaps not surprised to see him get elevated and given his opportunity, because the pace is what Liverpool need at the back. Yeah, speaking to Billy Bean a few months ago, he seemed to put forward the theory that Liverpool had signed Vandenberg because he was sort of an average defender in the Dutch league, but he was an average defender at the age of 15 or 16. So you would think that he could take that next step. Possibly he will do at some point, but he hasn't just yet. I mean, on what you've seen of him, Ian, do you think there is a realistic ceiling for for him to make the Liverpool first team? Or do you think if he was going to do that, probably this season, given all the injuries, was probably the time to do it? It's hard to say, to be honest. It's a, such a strange season. I think I would be surprised, but I'm not going to write him off. I mean, he, he might go off and do, play really, really well. I mean, as I say, he's kind of veered between. Looks like he can't put, you know, two, you know, one foot in front of the other. But then other times where he's 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 positionally been sound. The other thing is that he plays the ball out of defence quite well. And when he first started, certainly seen him play in the. Uh, in the UEFA Youth League, there was a number of games where he just got caught out by long balls over the top, which he's probably not used to. Um, for somebody who's reasonably tall, 
that's why the game against Roseby in the FA Cup last year was quite impressive because Roseby did a lot of that and he, he won a lot of headers. So he can do it. I think it's just a matter of doing it consistently. And when you look at Liverpool's other 23s this season, because so many of them are either playing for the first team or in the first team squad, and it's the same for a lot of other clubs as well, that the actual competition there is perhaps not strong enough for him. He, know, he knows he's not going to be playing in the, um, in the, in the first team this season, but... If he goes elsewhere where they're actually playing for, you know, it's men's football, for want of a better phrase, then he can do a lot better, I think. He'll learn from it. Yeah, certainly. I think he only cost 1.7 million as well. So even if Liverpool were to move him on in a couple of years' time, they could well make a profit on that. I think that just about brings us to the end of today's podcast. We'll be back with the next Blood Red podcast on Friday, looking, of course, ahead to that Manchester United fixture. Plenty more to come throughout the week across the Liverpool Echo and Blood Red in that regard as well. For now, though, from myself, Matt Addison, from Ian Doyle and from Theo Squires, until next time here on the Blood Red channel. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye for now. This is the Blood Red Podcast.